How do you put this? The new meeting. Hey, I just got it, and then you clicked it, clicked on the side again. I will got it. No, but why not able to got it? He also can. आप got it करें ना? नहीं यहाँ से नहीं होगा got it. नहीं 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 you are connected, you are connected, you are laptop on Zoom. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Nay, he's passing by. <laughs> it's like it's, it's above the plane. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> oh, the cursor is not there. Yeah, yeah, it's not there. If it is Zoom, we have already shared Zoom. It is not actually We are already shared. If you want to make it, make it better. Okay, so good evening and welcome to today's uh, uh, special asset colloquium, uh, special because this is a part of uh, TIFR annual chemistry uh, conference. Um, is that, it has been in fact uh, a tradition, if I can say this, uh, every time there is an annual uh, chemistry conference, they always ensure that asset gets embedded 
inside their conference it's so nice of you uh, to have us at uh, being part of your conference um, also warm welcome to today's speaker i'm sure she was already here for a couple of days but uh, on this forum uh, we want to welcome you uh, just for you and maybe some of the uh, delegates who are not part of our own family here uh, asset of course stands for us advances in uh, science engineering and technology it largely deals with uh, talks colloquia related to uh, the the you know the topics which are uh, essentially technology oriented uh, but we also take a lot of talks which is a bit outside uh, dealing sometimes medical technology sometimes maybe far away from there uh, but today would have one of our own speaker talking about i mean i can't even pronounce okay it's a machine learning uh, the configuration space using matrix product states okay this is slightly different title than what was officially announced uh, but okay i know the word change of words uh, but without taking more of your time now let me uh, invite ravi to formally introduce today's speaker thank you i'm not the speaker he's the speaker <laughs> <laughs> yeah okay yeah it's a pleasure to uh, introduce uh, devushri um, i know devushri for quite some time since i came back to india we've interacted at several conferences i can tell you she's one of the most candid people uh, quite you know uh, familiar with state of the art methods as well as the limitations so i'm sure you'll enjoy the talk um, a little bit about devushri um, she obtained her masters in chemical sciences from iic in 2005 and then she got her phd from cornell university in 2010 working with garnet kl chan uh, there she was actually looking at uh, density matrix renormalization group methods we call it fondly called dmrg right and then uh, she moved to university of southern california uh, for two years working with anna krilov on a surprising topic actually polarizable force fields which is a new topic for both her and krilov because uh, anna krilov typically doesn't work on that actually Uh, but anyways after that she came back to india uh, she joined csir and cl as a senior scientist in 2012 um, and uh, subsequently moved to iacs in 2017 where she is a full professor right now at this point so her group actually employs uh, state of the art electronic structure methods uh, dmrg um, uh, uh, and now machine learning right to look at uh, basically excited state properties uh, the interaction of light with molecules biological or otherwise and um, you know essentially she'll tell us essentially how she's integrating these machine learning approaches now okay so over to you devush thank you so much thank you for that kind introduction and uh, i thank the organizers for inviting me uh, jyotishman and kalai both of you and uh, uh, for rest of you for making this day really nice so um i am going to talk about uh, not just machine learning i'm go going to go from variational to machine learning as my original title suggests uh, but anyways before i uh, go into it uh, so i i am a bit unnerved hearing that it is about technology i hope that computer technology uh, is good enough as technology but let's see um so as was mentioned in the introduction uh, i am interested in uh, uh, photo processes of um, uh, biological systems mainly also material systems and for that reason i have uh, started uh, kind of uh, my journey by developing hybrid qmmm methods for excited states and in doing that you see the hybrid qm and mm part so the mm part was dealt with using these polarizable force field either they could be fragment based or we have also dabbled on a little with a little bit of machine learning in that aspect um today's topic which is going to be about the qm part and uh, there uh, we we mainly look at these tensor product state kind of uh, wave functions i'll go into the details of them and probably some of you can see those familiar uh, shapes that uh, omorto showed yesterday and um, once we have developed these methods because the idea is to apply them to um, you know interesting systems and their excited state properties uh we like to look at uh, the photo protection property of melanin which is one of our favorite topics um 
We also looked at spectroscopic properties of fluorescent proteins, RNA, et cetera. Of late, we are also looking at singlet fission. I'm going to start with a few systems so that I can keep the uh, chemists in the audience interested in the um, way that we are developing, why we are going in that direction to give that idea. Yes. Ah, okay. Ah, okay. I will. I. I will. If I miss some, please feel free to ask, because some of them, I have become so used to saying them that uh, yeah, I forget that they even are an acronym. But uh, <laughs> but I, I am sorry. That's that's my mistake. Uh, just ask me. Okay. Okay, so singlet fission. Uh, this was a work that actually started uh, uh, due to the nudging of Jyotishman. Uh, and here what happens is, um, many of the audience actually knows what happens. So, um, you know, if you have multiple chromophores in kind of aggregate structure or whatever, uh, uh, if light is uh, shining on them, you can form local excited states like over here. So one of the chromophore has excited, the other one, this is not moving. The other one is just, uh, well, not moving. And uh, uh, after a while, uh, you know, this, this can actually, if certain of the energy criteria and the coupling criteria gets fulfilled, it can form two triplet states. Now, uh, generally, we think that going from a singlet to a triplet state would be spin forbidden. But because here it is going from one singlet state to two triplet states, and you see here I have drawn the triplet states in kind of a devious way, where one is up, up, and the other is down, down. So the total spin is actually a singlet. So this is a, a spin allowed process. And uh, understanding this process has been... Uh, quite challenging it seems there has been different mechanisms that has that has been proposed uh, over the uh, last uh, decade or so and uh, our group is trying to find these out so that we can find better materials that are capable of uh, uh, efficient singlet fission process, which can, of course, then later on be used for uh, solar energy harvesting. So that's one of the uh, projects going on in the group. Uh, kind of related to it, maybe, maybe not, is to uh, figure out uh, how the uh, excitation energy patterns of these different polyaromatic hydrocarbons in its many different forms look like uh, when you have different planarity, different um, symmetry, different forms and everything. Uh, I will talk about polyaromatic hydrocarbons throughout the lecture because that's going to be uh, the recurrent theme on which we test our methods. Uh, it's actually quite difficult to calculate, it seems. Um, I already talked about, yes. So it is because it is well, it is, uh, it is, I work with it because I want to understand the excited state processes and they actually tuning a little bit changes a lot. So that makes it quite exciting for a chemist because you can fiddle with it a little bit and have new properties and uh, then you know, you can form different um, uh, devices with them. Ideally, of course, I don't make any of those devices. I just predict and let other people carry it forward. Or if somebody says, why is this happening the way it is happening? We explain it and then give it to them to refine it, tune it, make it better and so on. But uh, the reason I'm going to use them for testing the methods is to see where it breaks because a method is best when it's the most robust. So we are going to test with these met uh, with these systems, which seems to be challenging. So that's the logic. Yeah. Okay. Um, no, there were two aspects to it. I wouldn't just say yes, but anyways. Um, okay. Uh, and as I mentioned before, uh, we are interested in the photoprotection property of melanin. Uh, here is my student Orpon, who is working a lot in the systems where, oh, okay. This, okay, no problem. Uh, so, uh, you know, we are trying to understand the uh, uh, monotonic and the featureless spectra of melanin. 
uh, once we have understood the featureless sp spectra of melanin, the next question that always arises is how does, uh, you know, melanin is the skin pigment that is present in our body. So it absorbs all of the sunlight. So it has to have that monotonic spectra, that really featureless spectra that uh, absorbs all of sunlight. But it has to absorb that sunlight and still be in its own form. It can't degrade because then we will have many, uh, you know, uh, harmful effects. Uh, so uh, we try to understand what happens to melanin once it absorbs these UV and visible light. Um, and finally, another project that has very... Yes, sure. Ah, so uh, uh, you see this is... Uh, the red one is dihydroxyindole, which is the building block monomer of melanin. So there you see a normal molecule-like spectra, but once it becomes in this aggregate form, that uh, spectral features washes out and it kind of uh, can absorb throughout the, all the wavelengths. Okay. okay. Uh, and finally, one uh, other uh, topic we are interested in and Garnet has been interested in for a long time now, uh, is uh, in uh, in spin crossover systems and uh, or even not just spin crossover systems in large magnetic molecules or molecular magnets and stuff like that. So this this was a really huge manganese oxygen uh, species that was computed in this paper. Uh, quite an elegant calculation. Um, so these kind of systems. And these kind of properties would be where I would like to make a difference. So what are the different steps that are involved in it? Essentially, this is what an excited state process of any generic molecule could look like. It looks a bit overwhelming, but let me guide you through it. So you have the reactant over here. Once light uh, is shine on, you shine light on them, it can go up to the first optically active excited state. It could be S1, S2, S3, depending on what your molecular species is. Once it reaches that uh, state, it essentially can encounter, uh, it will basically start coming down the uh, gradient of that uh, potential energy surface. And along the potential energy surface, it can find different crossings, such as a conical intersection, which basically means a crossing between two singlet states, or it can also find a crossing between a singlet and triplet state. And thereby, after these various crossings and minima and so on and so forth, it can either come down non-radiatively back into the reactant form, or it can react and form some kind of a, uh, a, a you know, photo product form. So that can also happen. Along with the non-radiative uh, processes, there could also be radiative processes, which we already know, such as fluorescence and phosphorescence. So all of these processes, one would ideally like to capture. So how do I go about doing it? Well, first, let's kind of try to take a look at it in a kind of a snapshot way. If I stopped the molecule and looked at it at one time, instant and then go and go ahead to the next time instant and keep doing that that's going to be my approach somewhat different from what Amorto mentioned before because here i'm going to first start with a completely adiabatic picture and build in the diabetic aspects as it as one requires later on i'm only talk i today i'm only going to talk about the adiabatic aspects so we basically need at that time instant to solve an electronic structure problem. What that means, I start with a Born-Oppenheimer approximation where I have said that in that time instant, the atoms are completely frozen in space and it's only the electronic motion or the electronic structure that I care about. And to begin with, in much of wave function theory as it is done, you start with a mean field approximation, which is of course not great because everything is interacting with everything. And somehow you have said that all the interactions are washed out in kind of an average sort of a way. But you start with a mean field approximation nevertheless, where, whereby you get, get the concept of the orbitals out. Orbitals to a chemist is very close to their heart because that gives us the access to understand chemistry. These are these one electron wave functions. 
at this point all of correlation is absent and I am going to first show you that if I add in the correlations in a perturbative approach, what the problems would be. I am not going to do that in my work because you will see that there will be problems when I just add in the correlation as a perturbation. Okay. So let's take a very small molecule. I was talking of biology and proteins and all of that big stuff. From there, I have come down to a water molecule and I'm pulling its bonds apart. As a chemist, I need to break bonds and make bonds. So let's do some. Okay. So here you see the black curve is the exact potential energy surface as I break apart a bond. However, if you use any of the perturbative approximations such as MP2 or even CCSD, which is at the heart of it perturbative in nature, uh, you see that it really has unphysical nature. As in, if you break it apart at infinite separation, it should smoothly go to zero. Interaction energy should not bump up and down and do all crazy stuff, but it does. And the reason for that is the mean field approximation, which is fine near the equilibrium, is not that great when you are starting to pull apart those bonds. So your perturbation term is becoming very big, and therefore you cannot use perturbation in those situations. So of course, our normal way of thinking, I'll solve what I can, what I cannot, I'll put back perturbatively is not going to work here. That's the main problem of electron correlation. Yes. Sorry. So the previous slide, right? Uh, no, wait. No, you, no, I'm there was one, forward. Sorry, sorry. one thing that went away. Yes. Yeah. Right. So a uh, couple of questions. Yes. Because okay. yeah, yeah. What, what is you said exact, that black yes. curve is exact. How do you know that? Oh, okay. Uh, so there we have taken um hmm, very good question. This is actually a full CI calculation, which basically CI. full full configuration interaction calculation. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, uh, which basically means that you have built the mean field uh Slater determinant, you have added all possible Slater determinants that you can create in that basis and diagonalize the Hamiltonian in that full basis. Great. Thanks. In, in the full basis. In the full basis. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And when you do perturbations around the mean field, uh, in many other places, we know that perturbation theory fails yes. if you just take the leading order or a few orders. Yeah. Okay. And there are techniques for summing infinite classes of them. Yes. So many body theory yes. is full of them. So there aren't such methods? Uh, actually, the CCSD is coupled cluster singles doubles. That essentially, what you are saying, it adds up all the perturbation. That is CCSD. But even there, it falls apart. It doesn't, it really does not work conceptually perturbatively. Okay. And what is MP2? MP2 is molar placet perturbation up to second order. Okay. Yeah. Hmm. That makes me understand how many yeah, acronyms will we take for granted. <laughs> okay. Uh, good. Um, so uh, just to uh, kind of uh, re-emphasize the point here, for the same curve that, I, that we saw, saw last time, here I'm just plotting the errors with respect to the exact. So you see the error is increasing and then going to, it's still increasing because it is going to negative infinity at infinite separation. That's a disaster for a chemist. If I can't break a bond, I mean, I should just give up. So that's the problem. And what is more of a problem is that this same effect that I showed with this water molecule shows up for excited states, which I mentioned I was interested in. Diradicals and triradicals, transition metal complexes, which I fleetingly showed I'm interested in. Polyenes, graphene, so all of polyaromatic hydrocarbons, which also I showed that I was interested in, and metal clusters. So essentially everything that I'm interested in, and for that matter, everything most of chemists are interested in, because that's where the reactivity is maximum. It can be tuned, all sorts of interesting stuff can be done, kind of does not work in this level of theory. Yes. Yeah. Uh, we are all in the bound state. 
No, but my basis states are on the atoms. It is an atom-centered basis. So if the atoms are going away, my base is also going away with it. Okay. So this actually can be me. You don't have to, to understand the solution to this problem or understand the origin of it. You don't have to study the more complex. You can just study what it is, right? I could, but I can solve that much easily. Yeah, I understand. <laughs> But if you don't understand the method, yes. then you can apply it to the simplest possible. Oh, but I'm trying to apply it to the most hard uh, problem so that, you know, it still works. So you just want to do it because it's hard. No, <laughs> it's not just that. <laughs> okay, never mind. Um, as I kind of fleetingly mentioned when I uh, said what an uh, exact solution is, which is a full configuration interaction, this basically means that you what you need is not a single reference or a single mean field determinant, but many, many determinants and many references or many configurations, in at least in the valence space as a chemist thinks about. So what does that mean? That basically means that See, I started with these mean field orbitals where I said that I'm going to take one electron orbitals. Unfortunately, much of chem in, well, all of chemistry pretty much, there's no one electron problem. They are all many electron problems. And these all of these electrons are trying to delocalize while they are being pushed together by other electrons. To, so to have these kind of interactions completely neglected or included only in the mean field sense is not good enough. So in order to uh, actually capture this, what we need is um, to go from this single reference or Aufbau principle picture that a chemist is most familiar with to a multi-reference picture. And you can notice where these multiple references of electrons or multiple configurations of electrons will become important when uh, the valence space or the orbitals around these HOMO and the LUMO, uh, they are very closely spaced. When they're closely spaced, essentially you will need to consider more and more and many of them. And when I'm saying more and more and many of them, that's where the problem is coming about, as I will show in the next few slides. Okay, but here I'm going to first give you another um, uh, demonstration of why mean field theory is uh, inadequate, even in this uh, polyaromatic hydrocarbon, you know, these acene systems that I'm going to uh, uh, bring about quite a lot. So people have been interested in the singlet triplet gap, one of the reasons is uh, to study the singlet fission process that I showed, we need access to the triplet states. And people have used these acenes as a very interesting motif. Okay, however, calculations were all over the place. In 2004, density functional theory showed that there was a singlet triplet crossover, which meant that if I increase the dimension of the acenes, that is if I went from hexacene to heptacene to higher and higher acenes, uh, the triplet state becomes more stable than the singlet state, as in the ground state singlet state. Uh, in 2007, actually my advisor, uh, Garnet, uh, showed using DMRG that there is no such uh, DMRG's density matrix renormalization group, uh, showed that there was no such crossover. Uh, it exponentially dropped the singlet triplet gap, but it did not go to negative values. In 2010, uh, uh, and on the other hand, they said that this was majorly due to static correlation, which is the correlation I mentioned in the last slide, you know, when the homolumo are coming close to each other. In 2010, it was mentioned that no, it is not because of the static correlation, it is because of dynamic correlation. So what is dynamic correlation? It is basically the correlation between all other orbitals. So here I was taking only the valence orbitals, but there's the presence of all the higher orbitals or the core orbitals that are still present. So if those interactions can also be considered, then it becomes uh, the correct, uh, then, then we can uh, capture this effect most effectively. 
And in 2015, our group showed that both static and dynamic correlation is important. So it seems like a pretty messy problem. And if we can really uh, solve this exactly or as exactly as possible, uh, chances are we will be able to uh, find out what really is going on with this uh, with this system. So let's see what is the problem of, yes. Experimentally, the answer is known. So, what is the answer? Experimentally, only up to 10 or only up to decasin is known. Up to there, there is no single triple no, crossover. Yes. DFT in principle is exact. So, huh? DFT in principle is exact. In principle. So, why is it not working here? In principle, now nah, you have this exchange which is all over the place. Everybody is using different exchange, getting different results or different correlation and different results. Yeah, but uh, in this particular case, yes. what was the reason? Uh, it was a mismatch of functionals. Yes, it was because now, now this 2004 paper is extremely cited because everybody bashes it. <laughs> the wrong reason. Yeah. Uh, there was another hand somewhere. No. Okay, fine. Okay, so uh, again, coming back to the challenges of computing this uh, uh, singlet triplet gap. So let's look at the number of configurations, you know, how many ways I can put the electrons, even in the valence space, how, how does it look like? It is actually an exponentially scaling problem. And if your valence space has 30 pi orbitals and 30 electrons, which basically means if it has 30 carbon atoms, not that big, right? 30 carbon atoms, then the total number of configurations would be 10 to the power 33, which seems like a very large number to me. Uh, if I were to do a brute force stupid matrix diagonalization of that size, I would require 10 to the power 99 operations. Just to put it in perspective, the number of atoms in my in the universe is 10 to the power 82. So no matter how big a cluster I have, I don't, uh, I mean, computer cluster I have, I will never manage to uh, solve this problem in this brute force way. And uh, again, to tell you why it is exponentially scaling, let me show you this uh, spin system. So if I have sites, you know, like orbitals, if I have sites, and on each of these sites, if I have spins, so the spins can either be up or down. So there are two possibilities in each site. Uh, in case of orbitals, just to uh, kind of draw the connection, in case of orbitals, it would be four, right? Because the orbital can be empty. It could have one up electron, it could have one down electron, or it could have uh, double occupancy. So four possibilities. Okay, never mind. Let's still keep to spins. Now, if I have two such spins, I would have four such possibilities because you will have up, down, down, up, 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 down, down, right? If you have eight such, uh, if you have uh, three such spins, you would have eight or two cubed such possibilities. In other words, what is happening is if you have n such sites, you would have two to the power n such possibilities, which means your scaling is in the exponent, which is the other way of saying it's an exponential scaling, which is going to kill you very fast. Okay. And that basically comes down to the full CI wave function that I uh, fleetingly pointed towards. This is the form of the full CI wave function where these n's are the occupation numbers, which can be, as I mentioned, zero with one up, one down, or two. So different uh, possibilities. And with uh, respect to each of these configurations that are possible, there's some weight that is associated with it. So if you look at the weight tensor, the form of it looks like this. This comb I'm going to explain in the next slide. Okay, so let me give a crash course on uh, what these uh, figures mean. Uh, what, in other words, what, what I mean by the matrix product states. So if I have a real or complex value, so one number, it has no arm because it has no dimension sticking out of it, right? If you have a vector, then it will have a single arm because there's a single dimension. If you have a matrix, it will have two arms. It doesn't matter where the arms are. It could be like this, like this, wherever. It's just the number that matters, okay? And if you have a, let's say, five-dimensional tensor, you could write it like this, or you could even write it like that comb that I wrote with five things sticking out all at the bottom, okay? So that's the comb. So that was an n-dimensional tensor, okay? 
Now, if I were to then use these objects to do some maths with it, if I were to do a matrix vector multiplication, this is what you are, you are used to as a familiar matrix vector multiplication where J is the uh, index over which you sum over or contract over. So you have summed over this J, this J has disappeared. Finally, you are left with only the uh, index that is sticking out. So you see, it's all working out. Um, if you want to do a trace, you are left with nothing. So everything gets uh, summed over. So all the things that are joined together, you are just summing over them. Um, these are the rules of the game. Now let's see how matrix product state answers can actually help us in solving this problem. So as I mentioned, the exact solution is this uh, many dimensional tensor. And the size of that many dimensional tensor is uh, uh, is uh, generally it is d to the power n, d being the dimension of each uh, each of those things sticking out. Four in case of orbitals, two in case of spin. Okay, and the n in the exponent. Now, if I do a singular value decomposition on this many dimensional tensor, taking one of the dimensions as one side and all n minus one dimensions on the other side, I can easily do a uh, break, I can break it apart into a matrix times a diagonal matrix, which I have denoted as this uh, diamond over here, and a tensor now, which has n minus one dimensions instead of n that I started with. So that's one singular value decomposition. If I could keep doing this SVD many, many, many times, uh, I would get an object that looks like this. It looks like I'm doing something just for the heck of it, right? But not quite, because if you now go ahead and see what is the dimension of these, this object that I have created, it would have n in the, uh, you know, not at the exponent, it would have n in the mantissa and um, d, which is the exact time, which is the physical dimension and m square, this mysterious m that has come about. I'm going to tell you what that means. So let's look at the object in the center. This object has two hands that are holding its neighbors. Let's say each of these hands have m dimensions, which basically means that when I've done the singular value decomposition, I haven't kept all the uh, dimensions. I have only kept the most important ones. And for this purpose, I have only kept m of them. So, okay, so I have kept only m of them, and this is the uh, physical dimension d. So each of these objects will have a dimension d times m squared. And of course, there are n of them. So it's trivially, it is n times d times m squared. And you see, I have uh, got an exponential saving out of it. Exponential saving, sounds great. OK. Uh, if I wrote it in um, algebraic notation, this is what it would look like, doesn't matter. OK, what this really means is in doing the singular value decomposition, you are taking a matrix, a kind of oblongish matrix, and you are breaking it into a, 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 you know, a U a unitary matrix times a diagonal matrix times another unitary matrix. And um, what you are doing is in this diagonal matrix, you are just retaining the most biggest numbers. The lowest numbers you can just keep dropping, and still you will have uh, reasonable stuff. Yes. Uh, I'm not familiar much yeah. with the DMH, but so can you use this for say complex Hamiltonians as well yeah, as, not. and say if the Hamiltonians are not bounded, for example. I don't think there is a problem. I know you asked this question yesterday, but I don't think there is a problem. Yes. I think there is a problem. There is a problem? Potentially a problem. Oh, okay. You have to understand whether uh, she has written this thing in terms of unitary matrices, well, you know, multiplying the diagonal of the size, the matrices that you would land up with, or the most general matrices. Okay. Yeah. or may not be But that does not matter at all. So you have to check whether you are using that. Hmm. That does not matter at all. Okay. You will have still have a basis, and you will still be able to retain only a few of the bases, which is most important, and be done with it. Okay. okay. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. And yes. Yeah. 
Uh, I am not, but what is generally done is um, in case of DMRG, uh, when we do this, we first keep a M, let's say you keep 100. Then you check with 200. And if 100 and 200 are given Some the same you, you say, okay, my job is done. And you kind of warm up with small M's and then increase to big M's. Otherwise, it uh, the algorithm itself becomes a bit unstable and so on. Yeah. Cases that you're interested in, mm -hmm. these uh, examples that yes. you showed, are th is there a hierarchy in the singular values? Or it's just a continuum? No, it is quite, um, uh, it is uh, like a uh, exponential drop because these are gapped Hamiltonians. So you see a gap. Yes, I, this is a gapped That's Hamiltonian. Good. That's why it works so great. Okay, so uh, what this means and what it is actually used quite a lot in um, even image processing and things like that. Uh, this is a example that I got, got off the internet. So essentially, if you have all the roots uh, of a, a pixelated matrix, let's say you would have a very sharp uh, resolution Einstein's picture, but uh, as you reduce the number of M's and keep going down, 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 even over here, while you see a hazy image, you can still discern what you started to look at. So I guess what I'm trying to harp at, you will still get qualitatively good description of your material. It may not be quantitatively accurate. As you tune up the M, you will get more and more quantitative accuracy. That's what you are looking for. Okay, and uh, the other way of looking at it, CI means configuration interaction and MPS means matrix product state. Uh, what we have done uh, in this approach is taken our basis from a, a configuration interaction based picture where you are taking all possible combinations as the basis, you know, electrons up, down, blah, 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 which is of course uh, exponential as we saw. Instead of that, what I'm doing is I'm taking a lattice-based or orbital-based picture where each orbital does not coincide with a single number, which would be the mean field approximation, but rather a matrix or a tensor, which has the uh, information about entanglement with at least the nearest neighbor uh, orbitals. So that's what we are uh, accumulating using this approach. Yes. I mean, is there something about long range correlations or something that you are uh, missing? Missing here? Yeah, uh, no, we are not. Because there's a domino effect kind of a thing. So if uh, site A is connected to site B and site B is connected to site C and so on and so forth, in going uh, one after the other, and again, if it's a gapped Hamiltonian, you can clearly see that the entanglement dies off fairly quickly. And therefore, you can still get a reasonable sized M, which retains all your important information. So because A is interacting with B and B is interacting with C, when you are solving this, you are still retaining some of the next nearest neighbor interactions. But I'm wondering, I mean, maybe in some cases, it's not true, right? Because you may need uh, one, three interactions, for example, or one, four, for example. Is that something which is... Um, uh, yes, is it system so, specific? Is it? You know, it is going to be system specific in the sense that if it's a really two dimensional system, there you cannot line up all your orbitals one after the other in a straight line. So you cannot write it as a MPS, but you can still write or you can write it as a MPS. Your M will be so large, it will be of no good, no use to you. Um, uh, but you can write it as a different kind of a network state, right? Which has two, instead of two hands, it has four hands. So any general tensor network can be used. Now, the next question that will come about is whether that general tensor can be found. As in, I have uh, I have created an ansatz, but now whether I can compute that ansatz and optimize it becomes the next question. OK. OK. How badly am I doing for time? I have 15 minutes, so I'm in very big trouble. OK. So um, uh, it's okay, I, I just, okay, fine, I will give up. Okay, so um, 
uh, one way of finding out, as I was mentioning, so I have created an answer. It looks like it's a great answer, but how would I find what are there in those objects? See, if I had the full starting wave function, from that I can always get the MPS, but the whole problem is I don't have that big object and I have never been able to store that big object in my computer. So I have to have some kind of an algorithm to find the big object without finding the big object or find the small object without going to the big object, that kind of a situation. So for that, uh, density matrix renormalization group is a fantastic method where what is done is you basically find out the, um, you take two states, uh, two sites that are next to each other. You form all possible states that you can form with those two sites. Then you form the density matrix on those two sites the reduced density matrix actually, and uh, you retain only the most important states of those two sites. So already going from here to here, you have reduced the degrees of freedom and retained only the most important degree of freedom. Then you go and uh, increase the degree of freedom with the next site, and you keep doing this ad nauseum until you have hit the uh, end, end, end node or end lattice. So this is uh, the idea of density matrix renormalization group. And again, to give the mathematical equations of each of these wave function forms, this is the full CI wave function form, which was exponentially scaling. This is the mean field approximated form, which is just a product of orbitals. Um, on the other hand, Instead of just a simple product, now you have a product of matrices or tensors, which builds in some form of correlation between orbitals one after the other. Uh, that's the, basically the DMRG wave function. However, I'm showing this lattice as if they are one after the other, just like that. But molecules are not like that. Orbitals are not sitting one after the other. They are all a mess of orbitals in different atoms. So in that case, uh, there's the first problem that one encounters is to order them in that one dimensional lattice uh, form. And for that, uh, there's a method of computing the seniority zero wave function, which basically means if I start from any um, uh, closed shell form to any other closed shell form. So if I'm, let's say, uh, uh, exciting two electrons from the HOMO to the LUMO or two electrons from the HOMO to the LUMO plus one, like that, if I keep doing these two electron excitations, this uh, wave function that I form is called a seniority zero wave function. This size is much smaller, but yet I have en encountered all possible excitations, all possible orbital excitations. And from that, you can basically find out which of the orbitals are most strongly interacting with which other orbital. And that gives you an idea of orbital entanglement. Uh, this method is uh, uh, due to Katerina Boguslawski, and uh, we always use that technique. There are other techniques, but this seems to be the most stable one. And uh, with that, we have computed some things on polyacenes, which is not of importance because those were done much back, much way back when. But we actually, what we tried to do uh, is Instead of acenes, if we had some modified forms of acenes, like these polyazulines or fused acene azulines, which are also being synthesized uh, of late, uh, we basically try to find the singular triplet gaps and uh, acenes follow the, uh, uh, you know, uh, the, already the experimental results quite well. Uh, polyazulines, there's only one or two experimental points. Uh, the rest of them haven't been synthesized. But here we see that while we start from a singular triplet gap, which is much lower, uh, the uh, decrease in singular triplet gap is pretty uh, slow. In case of these few stacine azulines, on the other hand, we start low and go fast down. So in fact, we can obtain these singlet triplet crossovers. So that's basically gives us quite a bit of tunability with quite simple structures in, in, our, in well, according to a chemist. Um, so uh, we find these fused acene azulene systems, which has much lower singlet triplet gaps. And then we ask the question, why? Yes. Mm -hmm. 
speech singlet and which triplet? Uh, A zero T one. But if you are to apply this in singlet fashion, yes. So you have to see the S one and T one, right? Not and necessarily. Uh, actually, A zero T one is the singlet triplet we see, and uh, we see also S zero S one. So you see the difference between in singlet uh, fashion, you see the gap between S zero S one and A zero T one. Yeah, yeah. So S zero T one is this one. But for a molecule, if you are only calculating the S zero and T one gap, but we are also calculating S the S zero. That's not showing yeah, it. That's... But okay. uh, yeah, we have done. Okay. Um, but even in the ST gap, which actually for the acines, they said that, you know, the diradical nature uh, drives the reduction in the homolumo gap. Uh, and that leads to the reduction in the ST gap. So we went ahead and uh, kind of uh, did that plot for that correlation energy, where here is the occupation number of lumo. And here is the ST gap. And if you can think that this has some correlation well, I, I I don't see any. So there's there's no there's no correlation whatsoever. So this actually um, confused us for quite some time. And then I came across this paper by um, Ramsesha. Actually, I heard one of his talk where he talked about uh, quantum phases of frustrated. Uh, two leg spin half ladders, which does not sound anything like a scenes. But really what this means is this is a ladder. Uh, you know, it has two rungs and it is, um, uh, you know, it has uh, skewed rungs. It has these uh, slanting rungs. So what that means, if you look at the connectivity, this has this is a seven member ring. This is a five member ring. Next one is a seven member ring and so on. So this is exact analog of a uh, polyazulene. And what they said is here, the quantum phases were because of frustrations that were in, introduced by the spin, uh, spin uh, configurations. So we thought, okay, for our system, let's try to find that. So for, for that, first thing we did was we removed all the lattice degrees of freedom, uh, which basically means we uh, there was bond length uh, deformations that were there, we removed it. It's like all bonds are same for us. And uh, we also removed most of the mod molecular uh, Hamiltonian details. So we have only a nearest neighbor Hamiltonian with a single J. So, and this J is antiferromagnetically coupled, which basically means that if you have spins, they like to, be, and they are next to each other, they like to be antiferromagnetic. That's any only thing that I have um, kept in everything else I have thrown out. So what would I get if there are pi bonds, the pi bonds would form. But those due to pi bonding, there would be this reduction in um, geometry and things like that, that I have not taken into consideration. Okay, so this is a very simplified Hamiltonian. And uh, there are some in intricacies of how to compute these J's that I'm going to skip over. We did work very hard at it, but we are going to skip over. And uh, using uh, those J's, J parameters, what we see is um, for these molecular systems, in A things, everything is nice and happy. So every upspin, which is denoted as a plus, is adjacent to a downspin denoted by, the, by a minus. So everybody is happy, no, no frustration. Uh, however, in case of uh, polyazolines, there are frustration in some of the, uh, you know, uh, in some of the common bonds. So you see up, up and down, down, but here there is no frustration. So some of the bonds are being frustrated. In case of fused acene azulene, all of the bonds are, common bonds are becoming frustrated. Essentially what the molecule is doing is trying to reduce these um, up, up or down, down interactions but it cannot remove all of them because you have odd member rings. So that's what he, it is trying to minimize the number of bad interactions. That's all it is doing. And uh, yes. So I vaguely remember something like alternate and non-alternate. Huh? Where you have very good number. Uh, so if you remember my uh, undergrad chemistry, so there was something, some concept of alternate. Okay, you have to explain to me the concept, then I can probably answer. Okay, we could talk about it. Okay. <laughs> sorry. I'm, I'm, yeah, sorry. <laughs> okay, so here, so therefore using our method, we have, uh, and this is at this point, the variational method, so DMRG. Uh, with that, we have been able to find the, um, uh, 
correct singlet triplet gap of the uh, molecules, we have seen that we can also figure out why it is happening, why some of the singlet triplet gaps are so low and why some of them are not. So we can explain those also using these model Hamiltonians. But as always, we got greedy after that and we wanted to go into two dimensional systems. So what I'm going to do Ravi, is I will just introduce the machine learning part, part and formulate the wave function and uh, formulate the method and stop it, okay? Because I, there's no way I can finish it. Huh. Instead of doing everything in a rushed way, I think I'll do less, but uh, properly. Okay. Yeah, I think you can have uh, 10 minutes. Yeah. Start okay, great. Thank you. Okay, so uh, as was uh, mentioned about these M's and how they fall off and things like that, this seems to be a big problem when you have two dimensional or uh, multi dimensional systems essentially. That's because the um, entanglement entropy or you know how much there is entanglement between the system and the environment depends on how big a cut you have across the boundary. So the area of the boundary would not grow for a one dimensional system. It doesn't matter where you cut here or cut there. You are just cutting across one narrow strip. But if you have a two dimensional system, as the system is growing, when you make a cut, your area is growing, growing, growing. So essentially the M that you require, if you want to formulate as a matrix product state would keep growing, growing, growing. So DMRG is not supposed to, is by construction should not work well for two really truly two dimensional systems. I'm not talking about, you know, thin strips of something or the other, but truly two dimensional, two dimensional systems, it shouldn't work. So that's when we started dabbling in uh, machine learning and thought if machine learning can give us some uh, leg up in this direction. And the reason why we went into this direction was not because everybody was doing machine learning. It was because we came across this paper in 2017 by Carleo and Troyer, where they said that tensor product states, which is essentially what I am working with, is equivalent to restricted Boltzmann machine. And they showed restricted Boltzmann machine is a type of neural network. And they showed the equivalence for some uh, strongly correlated systems for many body systems. So we thought, okay, fine, we will uh, dabble in it a little bit. And uh, since at that point, we didn't really know what restricted Boltzmann neural network, all of this stuff was, we, we threw all of that out. We thought that I am just going to take an optimization problem, you know, variational problem is an optimization problem and rephrase it as a machine learning problem. So what does that mean? Uh, my job is really to find f of x or a psi of x in some in some answers, right? And the answers we have already defined that matrix product state. Here, if I instead of that answers, if I if I define it as a uh, as a neural network, that is also a different answers. In, if I have a complete basis set, I can essentially expand any function as a linear combination of that complete basis set, that's what the idea is. So I need to find our set of f of x, which is close to the actual wave function, y of x. What do I mean by that? Uh, okay, before I go there, f of x, uh, this answer needs to be flexible. It needs to be close to y for some training data. And it needs to be simple in its form. These are things that are required to make me be able to work with it easily. Okay. So what I have done, instead of minimizing the energy with respect to W, I am going to optimize the W to mimic some data. Okay, that's the approach. So that is how I'm going to optimize it. Now, what is data here? There, there was at least some energy. I knew variational principle. I minimized it. What data do I have here? Well, here the data could be some of the known weights or known co coefficients of the configurations. How would I know some of the configurations? So let's say I start from a mean field and somewhere around the mean field. I have a huge Hilbert space. I don't have knowledge about all of the Hilbert space, but I can keep taking small steps, actually Monte Carlo steps around the um, known part and try to find out more 
and more data space. So the sub Hilbert space I'm basically uh, sampling and figuring out what are the known weights. So I'm that is how I'm generating data to begin with. So some Monte Carlo steps, which is giving me some idea about around the mean field and a little bit around it. Okay, so that's going to be the basis of the uh, how I start the algorithm. And uh, using that data, I am going to minimize a cost function or error function, which is the difference between uh, what the function is predicting and the data that I have had at hand. And I am uh, minimizing the C with respect to the parameters W. Okay, so that's exactly what I'm doing. What is the benefit? Well, the benefit is we have never going to able, uh, have to compute energies, which required those summations, you know, those hands holding each other, those kind of things. I'll never need to use any of those. So those were computations that I'm circumventing. So I'm going to skip through the details. Here I'll show the results, which see, you can see that the red curve is the exact one. And the uh, using ANN or uh, artificial neural network, you see that you can get pretty close to the uh, exact wave function. This is where you start your training from, and yet you can train values which are so close. Okay, we have used some more, uh, you know, augmentation such as active learning. This that those are just details. Like how would I speed it up? How would I make it more black box and things like that? I won't go into that. I'll just explain the uh, broad strokes. We have also done bond breaking problems. Uh, but we kind of have moved away from the idea that we started with is instead of learning the CI or configuration interaction, which was an exponential basis, I wanted to learn the MPS, matrix product state. So that again, there's no problem. The answers, you can keep whatever. And you can still learn from the data that the Monte Carlo is generating. And in fact, we came across this paper by Staudenmeyer and co-workers who used MPS to do handwriting recognition. So what we did was we went and looked at their algorithm and really used uh, concepts of that algorithm in our optimization. Um, and it so happens that this optimization has similarities, severe similarities with uh, actually DMRG optimization even. So it goes two sites at a time. It optimizes two sites, then uh, does a singular value decomposition, then again optimizes two sites, does a singular value decomposition like that. Okay, these are the details of the um, algorithm, not going through that. But at the end of the day, again, see, with all of this, whatever pictures I've drawn, don't get scared, um, uh, I am still computing the cost function. And with that cost function, I'm taking a derivative with respect to these Ws, now the W are not the parameters of the uh, artificial neural network. The Ws are the parameters of these matrix product state. That's all it is. So there's no, no difference in the concept that is there. Okay. Uh, more algorithm, never mind. Now let's see how it works. Okay. Before that, let's see what is the scaling. I really like scaling. So if you do a, uh, if you do a DMRG, it scales as order k cubed or order n cubed. If you do a, a brute force variational optimization of a matrix product state, uh, you have a scaling which scales as uh, to the power fourth. And on the other hand, if you are going to optimize with respect to uh, with respect to machine learning, you will have uh, something which scales as linearly with uh, size multiplied with. I, I here I will tell you where. I have shoved all the problem in. So it is the it is the uh, amount of data that is required. We still have no idea of how the this scales with system size, but you know, we are just taking the first steps. Please forgive us for that. Uh, so this is where uh, the problem is occurring, will occur, and there is no complete knowledge of how training data requirement grows with system size. But as such, formally it scales as, uh, linearly with system size, the, uh, the algorithm. This shows that the optimization can indeed be done for a, a polyaromatic hydrocarbon again. And we can use it both as a classifier as well as a wave function answers. 
and uh, yeah so uh, let's kind of come to the end i hope to have shown you that uh, well matrix product state optimization matrix firstly matrix product state answers itself is very cool i'm very excited about it all the time its optimization can be done using variational methods its optimization can equally or even better be done using machine learning and we have a very long list of methods like ravi was pointing out you know if you have two dimensional systems you would have uh, networks that look like this or you could have three tensor networks you know all all sorts of crazy network structures one can think about so but the cool stuff is if you are doing it variationally you would have to find the exact way of uh, optimizing each of them so that it is computationally efficient for machine learning it is still going to uh, the algorithm is going to be exactly the same way that you do it for mps it it doesn't require any change in uh, algorithm so we are playing a lot uh, you know this long wish list of methods that are going on um and uh, we are testing it on two dimensional systems this and that and everything and we are of late also even trying for transition metals we have started that project with uh, uh, one of my japanese collaborators because i don't have enough computational resources he has and um with that let me uh, thank the uh, my students here the um, funding agencies and thank you I can't. Yes. Yeah. Am I audible? Yes. Okay. So I was just wondering about the uh, matrix product state where you showed, and you showed that uh, from the singular value decomposition, we are taking only one diagonal element. No. No. Few. most important ones one not one yeah ones. so yes <laughs> so, some diagonal yeah. elements not all few yeah so that essentially means you are uh, you are losing some data out of the whole thing right i am of course losing some data so how but those, that data is not so important that's the whole point it's it's even for um, image processing you know you zip an image you still can see it right and yes. you can really understand what that image is uh, showing you don't yes. need all all pixels like that okay but uh, here let's see if i just think about the data which i am losing yes what do they typically uh, connect to in the molecular system let's say uh um hmm. what does it connect to it would be it uh, see you would have problems only for very high order excitations maybe like okay. super high order excitations okay. but um, again as a chemist i'm always looking at low lying excited states there there is no change i mean no means no okay thank you yes yes yeah. uh, fantastic talk i got uh, some bit of it uh, what i was wondering is that uh, you said the way that you are trying to do the machine learning is that you're taking monte carlo steps mm -hmm. and then are trying to find out data that is around it which is pre existing data somebody has calculated the ci no i, I am doing that ci on the monte carlo oh so i see space monte carlo okay. because that is possible full space yeah. uh, hilbert yeah. space yeah. not possible yeah. but small space is possible how, and uh, how do you define that small space how, how do you think that everywhere you are so doing some approximation is good thing is to know how much you are doing whether how much effect that will have uh, so, so that is why we actually change the m, m the number so the one part is data the other part is even m so we change the m and c if truncating that m is giving rise to any error we even uh, this um, you know this uh, finding the monte carlo and when to stop learning that we have uh, actually used some active learning techniques which basically says from the previous step you take this uh, take a step and see if if the value changes if the value change just you need to keep learning if it does not change okay your learning is done that kind of a thing if i can ask one related question so uh, coming back to real systems so if i have i don't know anthracene or whatever it yes. is i <coughs> do you have an idea how good these things are given a finite amount of computation time? oh yes we have done on anthracene yeah we have real time anthracene so what, how do they compare the machine we, learning we, experimental results they they are uh, good as in no, they, i mean different methods 
the computational time computational say, full time CI, is still not that great of course uh, the scaling is better scaling means if i go to larger and larger, larger system, system i am my I, my increase is not that uh, much but actually our uh, our uh, codes are still not very optimized, um, optimized yes that is one of the things we are actually doing with these Japanese collaborators because uh, for big systems, we'll need that. Yeah. Nice work, Professor Ghosh. So I have two quick questions. <laughs> one is that there is a six pH for polyaromatic aromatic hydrocarbon. Uh -huh. You connected only one uh, five member in but then how you construct the poly? No, no, see, seven, seven on one side, five on no, another no, side. No, 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 no. Another uh, before, after okay, that. No, no, no. Okay, I'm going. Go back. Yes, yes. Huh? Okay, wait, wait. Babari. Give me. This yeah, one? Yeah, there, because you have only one five member. Either yes. You have a two five member or one five one seven. No, this uh, one is a closed shell molecule. That I can vouch for. Because we can, our code can only handle closed shell. No, no, my question is how you make it that's a, that's a, that you cannot construct the polyaromatic hydrocarbon. Aromatic. Money, Poly how do I, how do I, I don't synthesize, no, I just leave no, the cell. I am talking about the Lewis structures in a pen and pen and pen and paper. You cannot construct that molecule huh? because you need it. Oh, it's a double bonds where I would put. Yeah, because alternation. I, alternation. Yeah, because either you need a two I five member, either you need a two five member or one five seven. Hmm. Make it a deal. But there will be hmm. so there can, will there is a frustration. No, even also frustration, you can make it here. You cannot put the but frustration also. 75 also has. Yeah, 75 also huh? has frustration. But you cannot have a frustration in a 65. Or say, mm -hmm. you can have a frustration 75. Because to final total number. I have a question for you. Yeah. <laughs> okay, sorry. Yeah. Uh, because uh, uh, let's say in fullerene there are five member rings, no, right? No, fullerene has an event number. 20 ah, and 12. Okay, 20 okay and 12. I will think about it and ah, get back to you. I really don't know. Another, sorry, another quick question. So just where there you have a first you have a four member uh, so that polycene. Manif uh, tetracine. Tetracine. And then you have a alternative adjunct and then uh, 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 ha, ha. And ha. So from there, is there any prediction which is going towards the your S0, S1, which cases is that or double of the S0, T1? Oh, we have actually only because, for the acines found it, really. Uh, we were no, we tried. No, 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 my question is that. From there, can you predict the trend? Because for the singlet fission, the criteria is the S0, S1 equal to double of the S0, T1. So from that trend, which could be the close to that? Okay, let me tell you the story there. We actually started find, uh, to find for singlet fission. Uh -huh. What we found was molecular magnets. Okay, okay, I got it. I got that. I got it. <laughs> I got it. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sorry. Yeah. So I'm just wondering, you know, uh, of course, these molecules, maybe they have well-defined active spaces, but other molecules will have a difficult, uh, may not, you may not know the active spaces hmm. right away. So in those cases, would machine learning be helpful in choosing the active space? People are doing some things. I haven't checked those out. There's some work uh, by Laura, Laura Gagliardi. There's some work by even Garnet, uh, where they, ha they are trying to find the active space using um, machine learning. But I have re haven't really checked them out to tell you how uh, robust they are for many methods, uh, for many systems. There are already yeah. efforts. There are, there are efforts, yes. Because that seems like a reasonable place. And we are stuck with active space. We have to try so many different uh, uh, ones for carbon hydrogen it's okay but for transition metals and everything it's a nightmare yeah if there are no other questions i have just one final uh, you know question actually just for the for the sake of completeness you said uh, machine learning was optimizing based on data that you calculated yes. can you elaborate on the data uh, the data is, is uh, let's say you take hartree fock and singles doubles then you uh, diagonalize on that. You are getting some co coefficients. That is data. Then after that, you are taking Monte Carlo steps from that. After the first singles doubles, you don't take everything else because that will become too large. You take Monte Carlo steps. And in each of those Monte Carlo steps, you are adding some data. 
So in let's say few steps already, I mean, each of those steps, you are again active learning the uh, matrix product state. So if the matrix product state learning keeps getting evolved, you keep running. If it stops, then you say that, okay, my learning is complete. And you say that this, this is the result. The data is the coefficients. The data Maybe. is the coefficients. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So Thank Debushri. And uh, that's that. And such a very pleasant. Okay. So this is the only one uh, that I could contribute to the colloquium. I couldn't understand anything. <laughs> but one point I wanted to ask you while you're answering uh, Sudhirta's question, uh, you also mentioned about uh, the method, I mean, other than the neural network method. Did you also try using methods like which are normally used in, let us say, physics analysis like Kalman filters, which also goes by the same uh, strategy that you explained to uh, Sudhirta? Oh, did I? I mean, I'm asking did you. I, I didn't use that. Only physics-based method that I have used is density matrix to normalization okay. group. That, that is the only word yes, I understand. Yes. <laughs> okay. So, uh, so the the forum, the asset, uh, which is uh, where you spoke, uh, is celebrating 40 years. Oh, wow. Year. So, we'd like to give this moment to you. Thank you. Thanks so much. Yeah, please join for a cup of tea. Come back at five forty five. <laughs> Thank you.